Well, good morning. morning. It is good to see each and every one of you on this Lord's Day. We are gathered together each and every Sunday to worship our God and our Savior in the name and in the presence of his Son. And we are grateful that he promises where two or three are gathered, Jesus himself is there gathered with us through the mediating work of his Spirit. And so we gather, and it's good not to take this time for granted. Uh, I know uh, as we gather each and every week and we often go through a routine, uh, it's easy to just add this to the list of things that we do every week, and we do it by rote and not think about it. But it is good for us to be reminded, I think, every once in a while, uh, that, that this is a special time. This is, in fact, the Lord's Day, a gift of His grace to us in which we gather and we worship and we fellowship with the people of God. And so uh, this is a time for our souls to be refreshed, for us to hear from his word, and uh, to, to gather in worship. So I simply want to begin our time this morning reading Psalm 95, perhaps the, the classic call to worship used in Scripture. It calls us to worship and calls us to consider as well. And so I will read and pray together. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with song of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray together. A great God and King, we come this morning and we worship. We lift our voices to you We prostrate ourselves before your throne this morning because you are a great God and the God above all gods and the King of kings. Father, the world is yours and everything in it because you have made it. You own it all. You rule it all in your sovereign purposes. You use it all to bring about your purposes. And so, Father, we come and we gather this morning to worship you And yet we are reminded this morning that you are a holy and righteous God. And so we come humbly, knowing that we must come in Christ our Savior. We come in his name through the shedding of his blood. Father, we recognize this morning that as you have poured out your wrath upon him on the cross, you have dealt with our sin. And it is only because of that that we are able to gather in your presence this morning. And so we come humbly and we come joyfully, rejoicing for the salvation that you have brought to us and humbly because it cost our Savior his life. So Lord, we ask this morning that in all that we do, in all that we say, in every activity, in every thought of our hearts, that you draw us to Christ that you draw us into a deeper communion with him, that you draw our love and our affections for him because of all that he's done for us. We pray of all of these things in his name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together from the hymnal number 11, All Creatures of Our God and King.
22, of 222, of glory, laud, and honor. <laughs> I'm going to give us just a moment before we pray together a corporate prayer of confession that we might search our own hearts and bring those sins before the Lord this morning. I'm going to read for us from Romans 7, starting in verse 13, to lead our time of prayer of confession. Did that which is good, Paul speaking of the law, then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and though the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I, do, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do, not, if I do what I want, I do not, excuse me, verse 16. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see 
in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with, the, with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you now to pray and to confess our sin to you. Father, we confess this morning that we often feel exactly like Paul explains in this passage. We have a desire in our mind to please you, to obey you. We confess that we love your law. Your law is righteous and good. But Father, even though we follow after you, our flesh the temptation of this world, the temptation of Satan also often causes us to turn back to the sin that once defined us. Father, we confess this morning that we often lie. We don't tell the truth. We dishonor you by trying to build ourselves up. The truth puts our pride down and we are a prideful people. Father, we confess that we also often have lust in our hearts. We turn to satisfy desires that come from the flesh instead of being obedient to your law. Father, we confess that we also often have anger in our hearts. Anger that we do not use self-control, but we allow to bubble over. Not righteous anger, as Steve taught about this morning in Sunday school, but, Father, anger that is sinful. Father, we confess this to you as well this morning. And, Father, we, as we come to confess these things, we ask that you would give us repentant hearts, hearts that would be turned away from the desire of sin. Father, that you would give us hearts that are able to defeat the temptation that comes from the flesh, Father, that we would turn to our Savior, Jesus Christ, as Paul said, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we come now and praise you for our Savior. We're thankful for this communion meal that we are about to take together. Lord, that it reminds us and points our hearts and our minds to Christ Jesus, that apart from him, this sin that still dwells in us would still Bring us death. But Father, through Christ, you have given us life. You have given us defeat over sin through our Savior, Christ Jesus. You have given us reconciliation to you, Lord, a holy God. And so we thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for your word this morning, who allows us to know your law. Father, we thank you for this church, for the brothers and sisters who come, gather together to worship you, to encourage one another, to fellowship one another. Father, we thank you for Pastor Unthank, as he has been faithfully bringing before us the book of Luke, and as he concludes it today, Lord, we have a hard time to express our thankfulness and our gratitude for the Gospels, so that we might know that Christ is the Savior and that you are God. Father, we ask that you bless this communion meal for us this morning and that it will continue to hold our hearts and our faith fast as we await the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we do prepare to take this communion supper together, I want to ask a few of the deacons to come forward to help serve it. And this communion meal is a remembrance of what our Savior did do on the cross for us. And as we just confessed our sin and thanked the Lord for what he's done for us, it is this meal that God has given us as a picture of what Jesus did on that cross. So if you're here this morning and you have put your faith and your trust in Christ alone for your reconciliation to God, for the forgiveness of your sins, then we welcome you to come and take the communion meal with us this morning. But if you're here this morning visiting and you've not yet put your faith or your trust in Christ We ask that you would just allow the meal to pass by, for it has no bearing on you. 
It's our tradition that when you receive the cup and the bread, that you would eat the bread as an individual symbol of your salvation, your unity in Christ, and then you hold the cup and we'll all together drink as one body, representing our unity as Christ, in Christ, excuse me, as one body. Paul in 1 Corinthians gives us this explanation of the Lord instituting the supper. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pro proclaim together the Lord's death as we await his return. Amen. Let's stand and sing together again uh, from the songbook, which is the little black notebook in the pew in front of you, number five, A Debtor to Mercy Alone.
Good morning, church. Turn with me to Acts 1, please. This is the word of the Lord. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up and after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he'd chosen. He presented himself alive to them as his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Pray with me, church. Dear Father, Lord, today we come to you with hearts filled with adoration and thanksgiving for your love and faithfulness. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You've existed from the very beginning and you will continue to be forever. We lift up our hearts in worship, recognizing your greatness and sovereignty over everything. The heavens with their countless stars are yours, and so is the entire earth and everyone who lives in it. From the depths of the seas to the peaks of the mountains, you hold everything in your hands. All the creatures in the forests and jungles belong to you, as well as the cattle on a thousand hills. You are a great God and king above all other gods. Every good thing indeed comes from you. You are merciful and gracious. You're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You know everything. Nothing is hidden from your sight. Not even our innermost thoughts and intentions are fully known to you. Your eyes are constantly watching over both the good and the evil. Lord, you have known us deeply. You are aware of our every move and understand our thoughts before we even express them. You carefully analyze our paths and where we rest intimately, knowing all our ways. Even before a word is formed on our tongues, you know it completely. We thank you for your constant care and guidance, and we seek your wisdom and strength to follow your will in everything we do. Lord, we are thankful for your word and your spirit to guide us. Thank you for your hand in our lives. Thank you that our hearts are renewed, that you have given us your Holy Spirit to convict our hearts of sin, push us to sanctification, that your word is sufficient and more powerful than anything else we as people use to lift ourselves instead of lifting our eyes upon the cross. Lord, I thank you for our elders and deacons Thank you for the presence here in Greenbelt, for growth in our families. Thank you for willing people that are serving one another in this church. I ask that your hand continue to be in this church and that you would draw many to serve, that you would kill laziness, fear, social anxieties that hinder us from kingdom work. May we not only desire to serve, but endure in it. May our hearts remain soft for the gospel, and may the gospel be the scope which we look at everything. What we say, what we do, think, feel, all done in humility and in knowledge of the resurrected Christ. Lord, I, I lift up Chevrolet Baptist Church with Pastor John Joseph, Capitol Hill Baptist Church with Mark Dever, Trinity Community Church, Pastor Chris Spanner, 
Reformed Presbyterian Church of Bowie with Pastor Stephen Fix, and Greenbelt Baptist here with Stephen Unthank, Lord. And I ask that you would speak through whoever's preaching in those churches today, Lord, that you would soften the hearts of those listening, Lord, that you would clear the minds of distractions and, and fill them with your spirit, that there would be repentance and, be, and belief going through all the churches, and that they would continue to serve you rightfully, Lord. And lift us all up in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand once again and sing hymn 26, Blessed Be Your Name. Good morning. Turn with me this morning to the end of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, we're looking this morning at verses 36 through 53. Luke 24, verses 36 through 53.
Hear now the word of our Lord. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me, see. For spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything to eat here? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that, he, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. This is the living and active and ever-powerful word of our Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our Lord endures forever. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time that you've given us. And Father, we pray now that, that by your grace, as we come before your, your inerrant and holy word, you would use it by your spirit to illumine within us not only the depths of our hearts and see therein places we need to repent, Oh, but Father, that you would work within us an ability to see and behold and cling in submissive faith to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, may he get all glory now. We pray in his name, amen. I wonder if you remember where you were roughly about this time now on January 30th, 2022. What were you doing on the 30th of January 2022, right about now. If you were here, because it was a Sunday morning, about this time you were listening to me say this, now we will be beginning a new sermon series on the Gospel of Luke. Over a year and a half ago, we began our exploration of this most glorious Gospel by reading and studying Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And here we are this morning, exactly 79 weeks later, reading and studying Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 53. A lot, a lot has happened in those uh, 553 days. We've gained new members to our church. We've lost dear loved ones who have gone home to glory. We've welcomed new children who've been born into our midst. Perhaps most importantly, but certainly hard to recognize at times, we've grown in our love for Jesus Christ. We've grown in our sanctification as we've been, in a sense, following Jesus through this gospel as Luke has led us to read about and hear from and almost by faith follow in the footsteps of our Savior through these gospel pages. And I do, I do hope that you've grown in your joy and longing to worship Jesus as a result of going through this gospel. In fact, that's exactly how Luke ends this gospel, with a distinct note of joy and worship. Look there at verse 44. There's this note of almost unbelievable joy and marveling. But, but literally, the very last verses of this gospel has Jesus' followers in joyful worship even after he's left them. Verses 52 and 53. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. I pray that that's been true of us. 
That God in His grace has grown us to follow Jesus through these pages. And perhaps even if in a small way we've all grown in our joy and in our desire to worship Jesus as our Savior. Oh, how that ought to be the constant mark of the true Christian life. And of course, I don't mean an absence of sadness. No, I mean a persisting joy, a a Christ-tethered joy, even in the midst of sadness. Even as the waves of pain and sadness might roll over us in this fallen world, there is a kind of buoyancy of joy tethered to the life raft of Jesus Christ. And as long as Jesus Christ is risen and is seated now in glory where there are no more tears, and where he is, I will be too, because by faith in him, I am one with him. Well, because of that, I can still persevere in real worshipful joy. I could still have hope. It's a marvelous note to end the gospel on, and one I do pray permeates all of us here at Greenbelt Baptist Church. Well, as we noted last week, the entirety of this chapter, the whole of chapter 24, is broken up into three scenes. The, the morning scene with the women at the empty tomb, the afternoon scene with the two travelers on the Emmaus Road, and then here, this evening scene with the disciples in hiding back in Jerusalem. And as we noted last week, each scene follows the same outline, an outline of initial confusion, followed by a rebuke, then there's some instruction, and finally a move to witness. Confusion, rebuke, instruction, and witness. And that'll be our outline this morning. So think, again, when the women, confused at the empty tomb, were rebuked by the angels, but then given instruction from Christ's words, and and afterward they go back to the apostles and witness about what they had learned and seen. Or last week, the two travelers on the Emmaus Road, there's this initial confusion about what's going on. They're essentially giving up and going back home. Jesus, hidden from their recognition, rebukes them. He tells them they're slow to believe all that the prophets had taught. And then he instructs them from all the Old Testament about the Messiah. After which they finally get it, he disappears, and then they go back and witness. Well, Luke is completing his final third scene here, and he does the same thing. The disciples are hiding away. And and out of nowhere, Jesus appears to them, and it's utter confusion. They, 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 They think it's a ghost. Jesus rebukes them in verses 38 through 43. He then instructs them in verses 44 through 47. And then finally, they're commissioned to go and be witnesses in verses 48 and following. It's the same pattern, the same structure. And Luke is repeating in a triple form, almost like the angel singing, holy, holy, holy. Luke is repeating this thrice important major emphasis. It's the word of God, taught which opens minds and burns hearts to bring people to believe in Jesus and his resurrection and then go witness. Well, Just like we saw two weeks ago, the women didn't have clarity until the angels taught them and reminded them of Jesus' words. Last week, the the two disciples only really recognized Jesus after he taught them the scriptures and showed them how the Old Testament, their Bible, prophesied about the death and resurrection of the Messiah. And here this morning, did you notice when we read through it, it's only through teaching them the scriptures that, quote, look there at verse 45, their minds were opened to understand. And after that, They worship Jesus with joy. That message is the heartbeat, the the central dogma of Luke's last chapter. And it's a truth that will catapult us into Luke's second book, the book of Acts. Where, yes, it's the teaching of the scriptures. That now, not just the disciples who had followed Jesus around for a few years now understand and believe. But no, the whole world. It will be the catalyst, the main engine that fuels the spread of the church where folks who have never even heard about Jesus, much less seen him, all of a sudden come to give their entire lives to following Jesus and even dying for him. 
They don't see him. They don't hear Jesus in his own words. No, it's all because people are teaching the word, preaching the word, and spreading the word. At the end of John's gospel, during the same scene described here, John adds a bit of information about when the apostle Thomas comes up to see and touch his Savior. And Jesus, in response to Thomas's slowness to believe, adds this commentary. Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. In a sense, that's been Luke's whole design of this book. Remember, who is he writing to? His, his friend Theophilus, a man who hasn't seen Jesus but has only heard about this Jesus. And this gospel that Luke writes was Luke's attempt to get Theophilus to become a blessed man. A man who would believe in Jesus even though he had never seen him. Perhaps that's been your story this past year or so. I wonder if you've been coming here to Greenbelt Baptist and Sunday after Sunday, as you've been hearing about Jesus Christ, you've wondered to yourself, yes, this, this man sounds amazing, if it's all true. I mean, could I really believe him? Could I really give myself to following after and submitting to all that this man is and all that he asks of me? Luke's entire desire in this gospel. Uh, in fact, I think it's better to say God's entire aim in inspiring Luke to write this gospel is just that. That you would believe and follow this one, this, this God-man who alone can be your Savior. Well, let's make our way through the text, and, and let's see this passage in its full color. First, we find our Jerusalem disciples in a state of confusion, verses 36 and 37. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Now, we have to admit that there was an excitement in the air. They had heard the report of Peter, of the women, and now of these two disciples who, who, who had kind of heard from Jesus on the Emmaus Road. But Luke wants us to see that mere excitement about reports of Jesus, mere testimonies disconnected from the living word of God is not the ticket to true belief. We know this because as soon as Jesus does enter the room, they're not quite sure it's really him. Even the response to his greeting is telling of their confusion, isn't it? He says, peace to you. Like in, have peace of mind. Have peace of heart. But instead, they're so startled and frightened that they think they might have seen a ghost. So confused are they, so filled with conflicting thoughts, unbelieving thoughts, that Jesus himself calls them out in verse 38. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts, unbelief, arise in your hearts? This is Jesus' initial rebuke to their confusion. And it's basically the same rebuke he gave to the two disciples that we saw last week. Look, look back to verse 25. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. In other words, their doubts stem from a slowness to believe the scriptures. And we know that because right on the heels of rebuking them for their doubts, Jesus will then to move to instruct them, which is instruction from the word of God. Friends, I want you to consider that, that, that flow and pattern here. Consider here the place of scripture in conflicted and confused hearts. As we'll see in verse 41, even Jesus' physical presence, touching him and and seeing him. Even that doesn't bring a clarity and calmness and peace. Luke says, and while they still disbelieved. As we highlighted last week, and we got to highlight it again, it's through the scriptures that God designs to bring people to know and find peace in Christ. The presence of Christ is real. We get that. But it's faith that brings us to Christ. And faith, true faith, is only grounded in what we know about Jesus. And the only true things we can know about Jesus is given to us in his word. Even, even our experience of him can be misinterpreted. We might see him in a wrong light. 
I mean, that's why Judas serves as the example par excellence. He lived with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. He preached about Jesus. But Judas never really believed in Jesus. You know, what, what, what's needed is the clarity and life-giving, faith-inducing power of God's Word, always. And so when it comes to confused hearts, I fear to say this, I feel like I must, so many of us look for answers in so many different things. Not all of them are bad per se, but it's certainly not sufficient in and of itself. Take counseling and therapy, for example. Counseling and therapy, by and large, it's an okay thing to pursue. But any counseling and therapy totally disconnected from the truth and the power of God's Word Therapy grounded in a kind of postmodern and materialist philosophy of humanity. Now, that ultimately cannot lead a person to true peace of mind. Now, Jesus enters into this room and he says, peace to you. And there's no peace. He rebukes them and even allows them to come and touch him and, and feed him with fish and still no peace. They, they disbelieve. Well, until what? Until he opens the word of God. I cannot recommend to you enough the absolute power of God's word to bring about flourishing and a life of true peace. Look more closely at Jesus' rebuke in verses 38 and 43. After he asks them why they're troubled, he says, well, see my hands and, and my feet, that it is I myself touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. All of this does fall under Jesus' uh, Jesus's rebuke. I, I think we're meant to read it like, like this. Oh, you don't believe it's me? Come on then. Come here, touch my hands. Yep, that's me. Look at, look at my feet. That, that's me. Come here, give me some fish. Can a ghost eat? No. So come on. Why don't you believe that I've been raised from the dead? I told you I would. More than that, the scriptures say I would. I think that's the attitude here. But there's grace in his rebuke, isn't there? It's a rebuke that also reaffirms the reality of what they're not yet fully believing. And I think it's a grace that does this. It's a moment that they will return to over and over again in their memories where they will say, you know what? I actually did touch the risen Jesus. And it was the Jesus, not a lookalike, not a fake. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. By the hands and feet, apparently, and we sang about this earlier, apparently the resurrected Jesus still had as indelible marks of saving grace the gaping scars caused by the nails which held him to the cross. This was the Jesus. If Jesus couldn't be touched, if Jesus couldn't eat, then how could we know if this Jesus was the whole Jesus? A Jesus whose resurrection wasn't just a spiritual resurrection, as if to say, sure, you'll be with me in heaven, but it, it, it'll be different. It won't be a physical reality, only spiritual. I know this Jesus is the whole Jesus, which means he has accomplished a whole salvation. The salvation of both our souls and our bodies. You do know that we often sin in our bodies, right? And you do know that Jesus, the Son of God, is alive right now forevermore as the Son of God made man, the Son of God resurrected as fully man. That's a wild thought for me. That for eternity past, the Son of God, as God, who was pure spirit and invisible, in love for us, took on human flesh, and becoming incarnate, decided in that moment to forevermore be the Son of God who is encapsulated in human flesh for eternity more. And as such, all those who are now found in him will be resurrected on the last day just as he has been resurrected. Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection. And so we too will enjoy an embodied life forevermore with him. 
a life where the spiritual world and the, and the physical world become one, where heaven and earth, as Revelation puts it, will be united as one. This is a glorious hope that all Christians look forward to, and it's a hope that, quite frankly, helps us value what we do with our physical bodies now. If you remember the Corinthians, and we preached that about, oh, two and a half years ago, the Corinthians fell into this trap where they began to believe that the resurrection was just merely a spiritual reality, not physical. And do you remember how that played out in their lives? They, they brought in to the wrong idea that ultimately the body didn't matter, and therefore they could eat and drink with unrestraint. They could sleep with whoever they wanted that they could spend their earthly lives now in unrestrained hedonism because ultimately they thought after they die, that's it, no more body. What does Paul say? I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. But if the dead are not raised, then sure, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Oh, but do not be deceived, says Paul. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Do you see? That Jesus is raised bodily, and we too will be raised bodily, has implications now. And I think the mercy we see here in this rebuke by Jesus is that he's helping these disciples see that. And ultimately, they, they wouldn't get that until the living and active word of God was brought to bear upon their dull hearts and minds. And so that's exactly where Jesus takes them next. We move now from their initial confusion to Jesus' rebuke to now Jesus' instruction, his instruction in verses 44 and following. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Well, As we saw last week, so we see again, Jesus takes his disciples through the whole of their Bibles. What's referred to here is the law of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, the prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, there is no part of sacred scripture where the light of the gospel does not shine forward, pointing us to Jesus Christ and his life and death and resurrection. Do you see that in verse 44? That everything written about me? Well, that's an incredible statement. That already from the first words written down by Moses and then later by men like David and, and Solomon or the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Zechariah, that a major part of what they wrote was to disclose and describe the coming of the Messiah, the one we know as Jesus, and Jesus knew that. Jesus is saying yes. When I read the Bible, I see me. And not like the metaphorical me of like a bad Bible study where the Bible study person asks, where do you see yourself in this Bible? No. Jesus says, it's literally about me. Incidentally, this is a good thing to bring into your own Bible reading. Rather than asking, where do I see myself in this passage? Ask yourself, Where do I see the gospel in this passage? Where do I see glimmers of Jesus Christ, his death, his life, or his resurrection in this passage? And it'll unfold and and beckon to you a deeper understanding of what the word of God is saying. But why the scriptures? Why wasn't Jesus' presence enough? Two reasons. Kent Hughes writes this, and I think he's right. Jesus did not want them to rest their belief in his resurrection on their personal experience alone. He was not interested in their becoming an esoteric coterie, an elite group with a special knowledge of Christ. Resting their faith on a miracle was not sufficient. 
He wanted them to ground their experience of his resurrection on the massive testimony and perspective of Scripture. We know this. Someone can actually believe in the resurrection and still not believe in Jesus Christ. Right? Just as Jesus had warned, do you remember his, his parable of, of uh, um, uh, the rich man and Lazarus back in Luke 16? How does he end that, that parable? If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. In other words, friends, Jesus' death and resurrection only make saving sense in the beautiful context of the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. It's the word which does the work of bringing about true faith. And that's the second point. Jesus knows that God's way of bringing about faith is through the divine scriptures. Did you, did you see what Luke wrote in verse 45? Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is awfully reminiscent of what he had done with the two on the Emmaus Road last week, isn't it? He pointed them to the scriptures that they knew, and, and Luke says their hearts burned within them. And what caused that burning in their hearts? Luke tells us it was that Jesus explained the scriptures and simultaneously opened or, or illumined their minds to understand what they were hearing and reading in the scriptures. Do you see what produced Heat in their heart was truth in their mind. And that's always how that works. Christianity is not a religion of mere emotionalism. And there is emotion. Yes, I love God-given emotions. There's a burning passion of love that we have for God. And that's a good emotion, but it comes to us first through the mind. First through the unchanging, unfading truth of God's word. Everything else withers and fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. And we need that, don't we? We can't turn on the light. We certainly can't turn the light on in other people's minds, and, and we certainly can't do it in our own minds. We need something powerful, something divine from outside of us to do what we cannot do, which is to help us see and know the truth about Jesus. And no matter how well we prepare, no matter how eloquently a pastor can speak, no matter what reasoning we use or what PhDs you have, we can never open our own minds or other people's minds to that truth. But the great thing we're learning here, I think, is this, that Jesus can, and Jesus will open our minds, and he does so through the word. Friends, that's, that's a particular question that many people struggle with. And one, I think, is just a good answer. We'll come back to this. But many ask me, uh, Pastor, I, mean, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not sure if I really trust in him. How do I know? And I, I need help. And inevitably, the answer is, go to the word of God. And do you believe what God's word is telling you about Jesus? I think Luke loved this particular idea because he uses it later in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16. You remember Acts 16 when Paul and Luke come to Philippi? And there's, there's no synagogue there, so what do they do? They go down to this river to find a place to pray. And, uh, and at the river, there's these women gathered around, and they're washing their clothes at the river. And Luke tells us that he and Paul spoke to the women there. We spoke the word of God to them. And then Luke writes this, but the Lord opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to what was said. Do you see? It's the grace of God and the power of the resurrected Jesus that takes the word of God and powerfully uses it to infiltrate our hardened hearts and dull minds and through that word illuminate to us the truth of God upon which we trust and believe. Children, the very first question in your children's bulletin asks this. I believe Jesus is real, but I'm unsure if I trust in him as my savior. It is a problem we, we struggle with. Well, the answer, the question is, what can help me be sure? What can help me be sure? And the answer is this, God's word can help you be sure. God's word can help you be sure. Where else would we go? What else 
has the unchanging heavenly stamp of never fading away truth as the word of God. We must go to the unchanging and unerring truth of his word. And, and do, do, do you see what Jesus says that assuring truth is? Look at, look at verses 46 and 7. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Don't, don't pass by that quickly. Jesus grounds the good news of our forgiveness of sins first in the scriptures. Thus, it is written. That's the divine promise. God said it. And dear friends, if God said it, how could it be otherwise? And so again, as we saw last week, so we see again, it is first the word which gives credence to the resurrection. Rather, rather than the resurrection giving credence to the word. Now, to be sure, we need to be clear on this. The resurrection is the event, the relevatory event, which proclaims to the world that Jesus is the Savior and that our sins have been forgiven. But it's the scriptures which most properly explain that event and give credence to what it means. We need the help of God's word to figure out what God is saying in the resurrection. And the Bible says, ah, there's your forgiveness of sins. Well, there's the instruction, instruction from God's word. But Jesus doesn't leave them there with full minds and burning hearts. No, he now gives them their task, their commission to go and be witnesses of the truth they now believe. We see now their witness. Look at verses 48 and 49. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. In other words, once you come to truly know Jesus, you cannot keep that knowledge to yourself. And how could you? Knowing Jesus means knowing the only means by which we find forgiveness of sins, right? And look, look back at verse 47. The command given to all the nations in order to find forgiveness of sins is what? that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name. Do you see? Repentance is demanded. Think about that. You've been living in sin your whole life. God comes and opens your heart and mind to see the truth of who he is, who his son is, and therefore who you really are. You see yourself for the first time as, as one in deep rebellion against God, and all your sin now lies before you. What do you do? In humble contrition, you mourn your sin. You hate your sin. You repent and confess your sin to God. But simultaneously, you also see Christ, the Lamb slain on your behalf, the Son of God who gave himself and took the punishment you deserve. And so you almost immediately trust in and believe in Jesus Christ. There's this simultaneous mourning and joy. Repentance and faith. Sadness over your sin, but absolute joy over being forgiven. And now what? Now, because you truly love God, you also now begin to rightly love your neighbor. And because you know the truth, out of love you can't help but talk to your neighbor about the truth, about their sin but also about God's love for them and the provision he's given to them in Jesus Christ, you become a witness. Do you see? That's true of every Christian. Every Christian is motivated by the truth of what they believe to say, friends, come here, look at what God's done. You've got blinders on, take them off and look at Jesus. Jesus. I think it's true here, these early disciples as well. We see here a hint of what Luke will pick back up in the book of Acts. Um, a promise of the coming Holy Spirit, it was verse 49 puts it, will clothe them with power from on high. Dear friends, if you're a Christian and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, 
Well, it will be the case that in some way, and it won't look the same with everybody, but in some way you will be used by God to be a witness to Jesus Christ. Children, the second question in your children's bulletin asks this, if I really do trust in Jesus as my Savior, should I keep that to myself? And the answer is, of course, no. Tell everyone. Now, perhaps the disciples heard this from Jesus and they thought, Jesus, you, you can't be serious. You know, we've read the Old Testament, Jesus. We know that the nations are to come and find salvation in Jerusalem. But you're telling us that it is from Jerusalem that the truth of salvation is to spread? And more than that, Jesus, are you saying that it's got to be us who take that truth to the nations? Jesus, I, I don't know. We're not sure that we can do that. Peter, speaking up, Jesus, I just denied you three times. Oh, but look at that divine benediction at the very end of this gospel. The heavenly blessing Jesus gives here to this small band of disciples, verse 50 and following. And he led them out as far as Bethany. And lifting his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Here is a benediction from the Son of God as he's literally being lifted up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. This wasn't mere religious formalism. This was the Son of God giving a true blessing. And when God blesses his people, he blesses his people. It's a guarantee of success. It's a, it's a promise of ministerial triumph and victory. And they were to start, get this, in the very place that just killed the Messiah. And they did. As soon as Jesus departed, there's no sadness, there's no morose or any more lingering confusion. What now? What do we do? Now what does Luke say in verse 52? They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great Joy, dear friends, what confidence, what zeal. There's a striking note here on which the whole gospel ends. An ironic note, but a note on which we will end our study of Luke. It's the very last verse. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now, of course... Back in chapters 1 and 2 of Luke, the temple is the place where one finds God's faithful remnant. Think of Zechariah, uh, Simeon, Anna, Joseph, and Mary. But certainly towards the end of Luke, chapter 19, 20, 21, the temple is a lair of thugs and needs to be purged. The temple is the place where the chief priests and scribes have almost demonic control. Those who are the wicked tenants, as Luke 20 puts it. And it's the place that Jesus promises a destined day of vengeance and trouble in its final destruction. The temple is increasingly in Luke the place of sinister associations and a horrid destiny. And yet for all of that, it is where this little Jesus remnant gathers to worship. It seems like an ironic twist here at the very end that this is where the disciples would be. And I think that that's what strikes me about this last scene in Luke's gospel. Right in the bastion of their enemies of Jesus, his disciples are beginning their mission to be his witness to the end of the earth, and they're doing so, get this, they're doing so in the temple as the new temple of Christ, as the new embodiment of Christ's presence. And it's that truth that these gathered believers are, in fact, the new body of Christ. Acts will go on to say that they are the presence of the Spirit of God. These believers, this church, will spread and spread and bring the gospel to all the nations. And how will they do it? They'll do it by the blessed power of the resurrected Son of God and always by the preaching of the powerful Word of God. And I pray that whets our appetite to hear now from the book of Acts. Let's pray.
Let us pray together. Father, so, so often we find ourselves chasing after the wind, hoping to find something that would give us security in this life. Lord, we, we desire to feel that we have certainty, and so we look for, for it wherever it may be found. Lord, sometimes we search in our own feelings. Sometimes we feel comfort if our friends or our family agree with us. Or sometimes we seek to have society affirm us. Or perhaps the experts in society. Or Lord, sometimes we seek we desire, we think it would be nice if we had some type of supernatural or mystic experience that would give us certainty of what we have heard. Oh Lord, we pray that you would give us a desire to have something more certain than all of those things. Lord, we remember that Peter tells us that even though he saw you face to face, that he felt you with his hands, that he was on the holy mountain when you were transfigured before him. Lord, we know that he tells us that we were given something more sure. We were given your word. And Lord, we pray that we would have that confidence in your word that we would not doubt your word when the serpent or when society, when the world tells us to doubt it, but, Lord, that we would have the confidence that Peter tells us to have in your word. Lord, we pray that our confidence would overflow into our lives, that we would go to your word daily, that we would conform our lives more and more in accordance to what we see written there. That we would not value any opinion more than what is written in your word, even if we have to change what we have done for so long. Lord, we pray that we would trust in your word so much that we would change, that we would throw everything away to follow after your word. For in it we find you, Lord, and you are what we want. And Lord, we pray that this would not only fill our own lives, but it would overflow into the lives of those around us. We pray that we would speak your word to those around us we know don't believe. Let us preach your gospel to them, we ask. And Lord, we pray that we would speak your word to those around us we know do believe, that we would encourage them with your word, that we would rebuke them with your word, that we would strengthen them with your word, we pray, that we would not feel the need to look for other sources of stability, but we would know that it, uh, your word is our firm foundation, Lord. And we pray that it would cause us to continually glorify your name, just as the church in Acts, or just as the church at the end of Luke. Let us glorify your name, both now and forever, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn 656, A Mighty Fortress.
page. Uh, please uh, put it on your calendar to come August 24th, that's Thursday, August 24th, for our next installment of the Young Narnians. The Young Narnians, a group committed to living in this world with an almost Lewis-like imagination, but a biblical faith as we follow Aslan with courage, with all the ups and downs that this world faces us. So again, uh, high school, college, August 24th, Thursday, 5.30 p.m. here for the Young Narnians. Now, if you'd please stand for this morning's benediction. A pastor loves to have the whole church sitting under the word of God because a good pastor realizes that that's the most powerful thing, and yet he's almost sad and, um, and scared as the sheep go off into the world. Uh, there are many false lions out there trying to get us young Narnians. And so what does a pastor have? Well, he has the model of Christ and his benediction. Uh, the New Testament letters with, which end with benediction. So this isn't just mere religious formalism. This is a pastor uh, in the power of the resurrected Christ raising his hand of blessing and almost, as it were, trying to get the word to strengthen you as you go out. So please, in the power of Christ, receive this morning's benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.